Ladies and gentlemen, arriving in studio is our brand new Pine Phone Braveheart Edition. Mr. West Payne, would you care to do the unboxing, sir? Oh, I love this. I mean, I, even on the side, model, Pine Phone, Linux smartphone. How cool is that? That's exactly what I want. <laughs> I know, it is so cool. Now, truth be told, I've already taken it out of the box once and played Whoa. around for a little bit. But it's bigger than you'd expect, it isn't is, it? It is, but it's... It's shiny. I mean, it it looks like a phone. Yeah, it it looks like a legit phone, and it feels really good in the hand. A lot better than I was expecting. How wow. about that? Wow, nice nice finish on the back, smooth. USB C. USB C port right there on the bottom. You know, it's maybe a little thicker than some phones I'm used to, but not not much. I mean, it's it's no. I I mean, I could be way off, but it feels. No bigger or thicker than, say, like the Nexus 6 yeah, S or yeah, whatever it was. You're absolutely right. Uh, yeah. It's pretty cool. It's real. And when you hold it in the hand, you you have a real appreciation of the feet that has just been pulled off here. And even has a headphone port. Hello, friends, and welcome in to your Unplugged program, episode 340. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hello, Wes. This is really exciting. I've been looking forward to episode 340. And I didn't expect you to bring this entire taco plate. This is really nice. You know, I, I will apologize. We will, we will be eating some tacos during the show. It's, you know, it is episode 340, and that's how we're celebrating. These look so tasty. But on the show today, we have a lot of community news to get into, including a brand new community news sub-segment, the first ever on the Unplugged program. A bit on burnout still. We've gotten some more feedback. Our friends from Elementary OS are here to talk about the App Center and the success of their fundraiser. And then we'll wrap it up with some highlights from Fosdom 2020. Pretty nice, Wes. This is a giant show. Pretty nice. And, of course, we have a slammed mumble room today. Time appropriate greetings virtual lug. Hello. 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 Howdy. Hey. Oh, this is a wow. record breaker. That is definitely a record breaker. <laughs> so awesome. Hello, everybody. Ace Nomad, Brent, Bite, Carl, Cassidy, Dan, Drifter, Dusty, Frank, John, Colonel, Mario Grip 2, Mini Mech, Nervo, Steve, and Tech Mav are just in the main on air. And then there's a whole other group up in the quiet listening. But also, a big warm welcome back to Mr. Bacon. Hey, Cheesy, how you doing? Hey, everybody. I'm doing good, man. Glad to be back. We missed you. Good to have you back. Glad you're uh, up and at least going enough to join us on the show today because there's a ton for us to get into. And uh, one of them is installed right here on my machine right now, Wes. Plasma 5.18 is out. It's a doozy. It's an LTS, which, of course, stands for long-term support. Yeah, that means 5.18 will be updated and maintained by the KDE contributors for the next two years. Regular versions are just four months. Boom. So this is an overall continuing improvement to the look, better support for GTK applications using client-side decorations, and as well, as well. I mean, I guess if you're coming, thinking about this, if you're coming from the past LTS release of Plasma, which was 5.12, which shipped in Kubuntu, you have a totally new notification system, all new web browser integration, new lock screen, Totally redesigned system settings panel. Totally new display management, uh, including, um, what's it called, fractional scaling support yeah. in there. Flatpak support and Discover. Night color features. Thunderbolt device support. It's a huge, huge, huge upgrade if you're coming from the past LTS. Still pretty good if you're coming just from the previous release, though. There's some nice things in there. Oh, yes. Okay, so you mentioned fractional scaling. That's now a lot less glitchy on X11. Glitchy, you say? Oh, yeah. You don't less want, glitchy? You, you don't want that. I don't want glitches. I mean, I'm not promising it's glitch-free, but significantly less glitchy, let's say. Hey, Wes? Um, what's a glitch? Oh, you've never encountered that. I mean, what, what is it? Like, technically, what is a glitch? What 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 is a glitch? I don't know what a glitch is. And are they talking about bugs? Do they mean it's less buggy? Is that what they mean? <laughs> what does a glitch mean? A sudden, usually temporary malfunction or irregularity of equipment. Oh, a bug. Okay. Yeah, okay. Good. Less go. bugs. That's yeah. good. That's less a, bugs. That's good. Few, fewer bugs. Probably is what Joe <laughs> wants you to say. Fewer also, bugs. If you have an Nvidia GPU, that info is now in cases card. Hey, that's pretty handy. And my favorite, a redesigned audio volume system widget. I love that. And uh, Joey over at OMG Ubuntu has a really nice write-up that I think is a little bit better than the official 
right up. But not that it's not bad. It's just Joey really did a great job of yeah. summarizing it. So we'll link to that. There's just another bit of hardware news to get into, and that is this monster of a Thaleo desktop that System76 launched. It's a whole new line that's powered by these brand new Ryzen Threadripper CPUs. Yeah, so it's actually launched in conjunction with these new Ryzen Threadripper 3990X. And with that, we have the Thaleo Major R2, which has those Threadripper CPU options. And wow, there's a lot in here. Yeah. So the base configuration starts at 16 gigs of RAM, 250 gigabyte NVMe. A, uh, I said that right this time, right? Didn't I? Yes. RX uh, 550. And a 1,000-watt power supply. But you can get the thing pretty low. Yeah, I think these specs might be more suitable to you, Chris. 64-core Threadripper, 256 gigs of DDR4 RAM, and 46 terabytes of storage. I'm sorry, between, what? Yeah, that's three NVMe SSDs and eight SATA drives. I'm sorry, did you say did you, how many terabytes of storage? 46. Okay. On the graphics side, uh, you can also have dual NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2080 Ti's. I'm going to go configure one right now. So I'll get a 64-core uh, Threadripper system, possibly. Let's see. I'll, I'll start with, uh, realistically, I don't need 64 cores. I'd probably be happy. I could probably live with 24 cores. Plenty of cores. Probably. I would like 32 gigs of RAM, but I actually don't know if I need much more than that. But think about the, you know, you're going to have the system for a long time. I agree, but I have been surprised at the systems that have 16 gigs of RAM. I'm still getting work done. It's a little tight, but... And the ones that have 32 and 64 feel about the same to me. You're so reasonable. But that 250 gig MVME has to go. Yeah, think of all the things you're going to be doing on a system like this. That's going to be a lot of large files. Two terabytes on that sucker. You can get an additional one. Mm, I think I won't. I think instead I'll do 2.5 storage. And uh, I'll go with a two terabyte SSD for that one. I think that, oh, they got to, you know, they offer spinning rust too. All right, I'll do that. I'll do a 500 gigabyte solid state spinning rust. I'm going to go uh, pretty realistic on the old GPU. I just love how the form is set up because the header is first GPU. <laughs> yeah, that's true, right? I'm going to go reasonable here. I don't think I have to go crazy with the GPU. I don't need a whole bunch of GPUs, but I want this thing to play a decent amount of games. So I'm going to go an RX 5700. Hmm, nice. It's not the best I could do, but pff, it's not bad. It'll right? work. I don't need a second GPU. I'm not going to get a display. I'll stick to the base warranty to try to keep costs down. And West Pink, can you can you read that final price there? No, I can't. Oh, yeah. 4807 That is a lot less than I was expecting. Yeah, right? It's not to say that it's not a lot of money, but I think the Mac Pro just totally like reset my expectations. This thing... This thing would be no slouch. I mean, I only got the 24-core version and two terabytes of storage. And, I mean, dang, man. And, I mean, that's before you get to the whole, you know, it's it's made right here in the States and it's all, all kinds of open. Oh, yeah, I'm not even, yeah, not even, I'm not even making a comparison in that regard. I'm just saying I think they're getting the pricing right and it's a really nice system for what you get. And it looks like they've... Updated the cooling system in there a little bit since the original Thaleos that we saw. Mm, yes. And, I mean, that, yeah, that's a totally reasonable amount, especially for, you know, a business buying this for an employee. Yeah. Or, you know, me buying it for myself. No, that's, that's not true. I just don't need that much power. I don't need it. Not yet. <laughs> well, it looks like they did change the uh, the CPU uh, intake to include um, another die cut, kind of almost a... Uh, Linux unplugged rocket along the side of it. Oh, that's cool. And underneath it there, uh, it looks like some additional Morse code. I don't know what it says, but uh, they they are pretty pretty cool about hiding little Easter eggs all throughout their cases and stuff too. It probably says linuxunplugged.com slash RSS. It probably, <laughs> it probably it does. It should. All right. I promised it earlier we have a new sub-segment here in the community news. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to announce the launch of Rust Watch. Um, I think that uh, that sound clips guy you hired is taking this job a little too seriously. That was a little much. You gotta have him dial it down. Well, a little it's bit. the first time for the segment, and you've been begging to add this to the show for weeks. <laughs> Jeez, that was a lot, though. That's a hell of an intro. I know it's sort of it's sort of too much. Well, anyways, Rust Watch starts out with a fork of Core Boot. This is going to be the uh, this is going to be the pitch for Rust Watch. What is getting rewritten in Rust this time around? And this time it's Core Boot. 
and the project is called Orboot. <laughs> you get it? I love that name personally. And um, it uh, currently plans to support Linux boot pl- payloads. Wes, why are we... Um, why are we doing this? Well, you got to rewrite everything in Rust, right? There is some logic to it. Like the the whole point about Rust Watch is to kind of have some fun with the fact that it is sort of the new. It's like the new hotness, but there is reason for it. It it, it is a safer language for maybe things like this. Mm-hmm. And you mean you know, there's lots of you know the nice modern tool chain that you have access to, and in some cases, doing things again, well, they can end up better design, learning from the past mistakes. Sure, sure, but it's it's not all roses here in the Rust Watch subsegment. There's also some concerns about Rust infringing on people's freedoms. Uh, of course, the, we have the four essential freedoms, and freedom number three is being imposed upon. It, uh, here is the uh, post from the HyperWiki they have. Rust and also Cargo, the Rust package manager, violates freedom to redistribute without their explicit approval. Their trademark license imposes requirements for distributions of modified versions that make it inconvenient to exercise freedom three, and this has turned into a bit of a conversation that has kind of taken a turn of, well, the problem is distros can just take up our packages, t- modify them, and call them the same thing. And now this is the argument. The, the, the distros want to be able to package it up and call it Rust. They don't want them to, be ca- to call it Rust without their approval because they want to make sure it truly is genuine, their product. Right. I mean, you, you, an example might be if you were to strip out the uh, borrow checker, for example, which is part of the, the important memory model used in Rust to keep things safe. And if you, if you called that Rust, I mean, that, that wouldn't really be Rust. It's an interesting question because it is sort of, you know, it's not necessarily violating those freedoms. It's still, it's still entirely open source. The, it's, it's a trademark issue, kind of if you remember the, the whole Ice Weasel Firefox business. Yes. It's definitely similar to that. But, of course, the, the code is all still, you know, open source. Steve Klabnik, who's a, a Rust developer, did respond over at Hacker News and said basically, yes, the intention of the policy is to prevent people fr- from adding confusion around a fork of the language. But we do know that distributions make patches to Rust and still call it Rust, and we're fine with that. Nobody's asked to do it, and you know, we haven't we haven't instigated any any problems with that. So I think it's it is kind of a gray area. It's not maybe as free as we would like to see, but there are trade-offs to be made, and I think the Rust team has done a good job of managing their project and has got, gained a lot of contributions, even made a whole sub-segment on the show for it. So I don't know that it's the end of the world just yet. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like they'll work sorted out. But it was interesting to see people go to their edges of the mat and say, well, distributions do this. And then other people say, well, the four essential freedoms guarantee us this. But uh, we'll sort it out in due course. And in the meantime, we'll keep an eye as part of Rust Watch. Where did you find this guy? <laughs> yeah, he's real cheesy. If you hadn't brought the tacos, I don't know, Wes. I just don't know. Tacos smooth all wounds. Well, something pretty neat happened this last week. It really happened over the weekend. The uh, folks over at Elementary OS launched App Center for Everyone on Indiegogo, a fundraiser to get the team together in Denver to work essentially on a sprint. And their goal was $10,000. That was probably too low because as we record this, they have reached 110% of their funding. They're now at $11,000. Wow. Congratulations, Dan and Cassidy. Thanks. Thank you. So this is um, obviously a signal that uh, your user base gets what you're doing and uh, encourages you to keep going. Did you shoot a little too low possibly? Well, I think uh, what we wanted to set up is what the cost of the sprint was, you know, and we budgeted out pretty carefully of, of what what is actually it going to cost us to build this thing. But um, yeah, I guess it might have been that we we could have shot for two weeks or, or two separate sprints. Um, we're kind of talking now about like how we could handle some stretch goals and um, the kind of ideas are either... Uh, following up with another sprint, maybe uh, that or something, or um, as we originally planned with the campaign to use any extra funds to do um, remote contracted work. Sure. So Cassidy, I've noticed that you've been hustling like crazy, trying to reach out to everybody who's uh, kicked in, um, you know, contacting people to spread the word. Has this been a full-time job for you for the last few days? Kind of, yeah. It's been a lot, but it's been really fun. I mean, Dan, Dan did most of the, like, 
the campaign setup or a lot of the campaign setup work, you know, recorded a video. Um, I helped edit it, edit that a little bit and we've been sending out the updates, but you know, we've heard from backers that like, they like getting updates from the, the project, even if they've already backed, like we're not begging them for more money or anything, but like they like hearing like, yeah, Hey, we hit this percentage. We hit this, you know, number of backers. Oh, Hey, here's an update on the swag. So I've been trying to be really transparent with that. That's been, that's been really great. So let's, let's explain before we go too far what it is that the goal is here, Dan. It's uh, it's App Center for everyone. What does that really mean? The end result is a sprint that will hopefully produce what? The idea is that um, when we first did App Center, we did our fundraiser a couple of years ago, and it was um, the pay what you want app store for elementary OS. As we've been working on it, um, technologies like Flatpak have kind of evolved, and we see uh, developers that are looking at that and saying, hey, I would really like to reach uh, more users than just elementary OS users, but when uh, I publish on Flathub, like I get, I lose all the cool like pay what you want stuff that comes with App Center. We want to embrace Flatpak and make that the standard in App Center, so the developers still publish in App Center, still use our pay what you want model, uh, but also get like a little bit of that wider spread from Flatpak. And there's a lot of cool like privacy, it's security implications and stability and and all kinds of stuff for for users on on that side of of using Flatpak. So that's kind of the big idea is we're taking everything and rebuilding it from the ground up around like modern technology and all the cool stuff that comes with it. As if you were going to build it today, essentially. How much is this related to some of the work that Endless has been doing to create ways to pay for flat packs? So this is actually uh, hand in hand with that work. We've been in discussion with folks at Endless and uh, Flathub and Flatpak itself. And um, they've been really good about getting feedback from from elementary because they know like, you know, we have a successful pay what you want app store and they want to build that capability into Flatpak itself. So the new Flatpak authenticators is a technology that's uh, enabling that and um, it's looking really good. And so the end product would be a technology, a set of APIs or a set of libraries or what that developers that are targeting any distribution could use to enable payments for the flat pack on, say, Fedora, for example, correct? The flat pack authenticator is a part of, it's associated with the flat pack remote. So we'd have an App Center remote, just like you have a flat hub remote okay. today. Oh, okay. Um, and then when you add that remote to your system, it automatically downloads the authenticator that goes along with that remote. So then when you go to install a flat pack from that remote, um, it's up to the authenticator, which is some sort of, it can be like a website, or in our case, it's a native GTK app. So that'll come up and offer the pay what you want uh, download. So basically, if you target App Center and you put your app in the App Center repo, then you get those pay what you want payments on any Flatpak platform. I see. So we're not necessarily talking about the App Center software, the store itself, coming to all distributions as a Flatpak, but more of uh, um, the availability to use this new functionality. Yeah, that's kind of the beauty of it is that you get to still use GNOME software or KDD Discover or whatever it is that you use to consume flat packs on your system. Even if it's like the command line, uh, it still throws the authenticator when you when you go to download. So um, you can still use whatever your native system is that you like. You don't have to use the App Center app, but you still get to enjoy those apps and developers still have a way to monetize. And we're building the back end in such a way that uh, it should be agnostic and it should be easy to stand up your own is- instance of it so that uh, Flathub can take advantage of this as well. And we, we want to really like where anybody can spin up kind of an App Center or Flathub instance, make their own pay what you want app stores. Wow, that could be really neat. So, um, who sits in the middle of refunds? So, say somebody buys something via this process. Uh, that isn't an elementary OS App Center user and decides, ah, I don't like this. I want a refund. Is your project involved at all in that in that process, or is that handled separately? So the way it's currently set up is that uh, apps are actually sold by the um, the app authors themselves. So there's a it's a more direct relationship. Um, while we are kind of an in between that helps um, you know distribute those applications, the applications being sold by the app developer. Um, so now users will get a, an email that, with information about the purchase, and then they can, you know, if they want, they can request a refund that way, and that'll actually go through the app developer. Oh, 
Interesting. Nice and scalable, it sounds like. So that's, uh, yeah, so then it's just part of the support process that developer would normally take on anyway. So that's, and doesn't involve the project at all. I think that was like one of the questions I thought, hmm, I see people asking this and I don't know what the answer is to that. That seems very elegant and how it already operates in the App Center today. Exactly. And that's that's one of the awesome things that Stripe gives us for free as part of their um, their payments API is they they enable a direct relationship between the developer and the, the users. So it's it's really convenient. Cheesy, you had a question as well. So when you when you talk about streamlining this payment process, are you also talking about uh, like giving me the ability to set up an account that I can then tie to a credit card um, that will remember my purchases throughout? The, the app center experience that's the big thing that we're looking at is um well f- firstly we want to have something that's just you being able to save the payment and and do like a one-click payment right um, but the ultimate goal is that we would like to have some kind of way for you to um log in on another computer and restore your purchases over there and uh, we, we want to just make sure that we do that in a way that's secure and privacy respecting. And we don't want to like hold on to a bunch of private data. So we're kind of working through different models of um, what can be stored uh, through Stripe's API. And we can use tokens and their kind of proven secure infrastructure and what works better as like local data stored on your computer and try to keep as much information off of elementary servers as possible. Yeah, I would agree with that. Who wants that hassle? <laughs> good, good. I think that answers Colonel's question too that he had. Yeah, it's clear clear that there's been a lot of thought put into the design here. It feels like the project is transitioning to um, a next level of involvement with the wider community because I think also of Cassidy of your recent work with the free desktop standard around dark theming and going to these events and speaking there and having a presence and being part of the conversation. Uh, around those things as well as something like this, working with Endless and uh, putting something, con- you know, something actually usable around Flatpak for payments. Uh, it's going to have wider implications than just what happens on elementary OS, but should also, hopefully, improve the app e- ecosystem on elementary OS as well. So it's, I think it's a very clever strategy, gentlemen. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, we love that whole cooperation angle. You know, we can work together and build things and, and, you know, compete a little bit. But like, we're all building free software. So let's just work together. And the rest of us get to benefit. I think, too, it's, it's worth mentioning um, how important I personally believe it is to have a way to pay for decent third-party applications. Um, when, I, when I tried out um, the Mac with the eGPU a couple of weeks ago, and loaded um, some application to manage Final Cut libraries, um, just to several like apps that are also available for iOS. So I installed them on the Mac to match my iPhone, and the quality of the applications, while you pay four, five, six to fifteen bucks for them, um, is is really strong. It benefits from the platform having a clear direction for developers to build applications, publish them in a central repository and charge a fee so that way they can justify the time spent on them. It's got the support they need to make it sustainable. And uh, they've managed to work, make it work with their crazy, restrictive, overly controlled App Center model. And this is something that's more universal that could be cross-distribution, but still give us some of those core benefits. It's a way to do it better than the way Apple does it, but still reap some of those benefits of giving developers the ability to feed themselves. And I, um, I've, I mean, since the days of Linux Action Show early, I have been trying to harp on this point. I've given up. <laughs> I really have. I, you know, when 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 Ubuntu's um, App Store didn't really work out, and I just kind of gave up. I just thought, all right, this isn't this isn't the path to monetization. But then when I visited the Mac recently, and you can see the collective benefits now of many years of having these APIs and having these standards and having these tools, much like elementary OS does actually, having these things in place many years down the road really does have its benefits. And you guys are laying down some of the most essential frameworks right now. So I'm really pleased to see it got funded. And I think it should probably be at fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So I say everybody go fund it. We'll I a, did. We'll I have kicked a link in. in the show notes, of course. Yep, indiegogo.com slash project slash app center dash four dash everyone. Go there. Let's get them going because 
isn't this exactly how we want to see other distributions operating too? And the thing that's pretty great about this is it's it's a direct lever. The users and the community are funding this. They as a team are getting together and producing code. It's it's a pretty great opportunity to be directly involved with the development. And I would argue an opportunity you don't get with commercial software development ever, other than going and buying their products directly, which is a very detached way. This is you're directly helping developers. It's it's pretty special. So it's good beautiful. luck. I will uh, give it a ding for that one. And great work, gentlemen. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to see it proceeding. You know, I wasn't. I think you launched it on a Friday, right? Who does that? Who launches? Or was it Thursday? I can't remember. Yeah, it was, it was Friday morning. It was kind of a weird time, and then it <laughs> blew up over the weekend. So. That's never gonna work. <laughs> yeah, well, what, by like Monday, midday Monday, you guys had already hit your goal, right? Yeah. Yeah, Monday yeah. afternoon. I really think you know you really played you know you really played the uh, the game of getting out there, getting the word out there, casting the net as far as possible, thanking people, being part of the community while it was happening, and I think it paid off. And um, I'd love to hear how it goes when you guys. I would love to be able to go. I don't like don't think it's going to be possible, but I was uh, putting feelers out there. But if uh, if if nothing else, love to have one of you guys join us or both of you join us again to just kind of give us an update afterwards to let everybody know how it went. Like, that'd be really cool if you could make Will it work. Will do, yeah. Thank you, guys. Wonderful. Uh, one note before we get to Fosdom, uh, and I don't know if we're going to keep doing this anymore. It's sort of gotten a life of its own, and it's this burnout topic we've talked about. And you'll recall this really kind of came up, I want to say, almost a month ago on the show when – well, it really kind of came up when a, a, a PPA maintainer got really frustrated by demands that were being put on him. And pulled his his PPAs, which included ZFS on Linux for Ubuntu and a bunch of other really critical packages. And that's when the burnout conversation came up. And we found this clip from Fosdom, which I think we'll just play now because it almost perfectly summarizes the issue that that developer was going through, as well as what was the blog we read, Wes? That was super. Oh yeah, Drew Duvall's yes, post about Drew you know, just how yep. hard and beautiful it is to work in FOSS software. That was a good post and really got us thinking about this. And you found a clip from Fosdom. It does have a bit of audio noise. I think it's just on a wireless mic, but it's totally understandable. All projects go through, or successful projects, go through a sort of, please, please contribute to my project, please like me, to a, oh my God, what do I do with everybody liking me so much? This is a scaling problem in open source. And in Linux, the crisis point was actually reached in 2002, which is pretty good. This is 11 years after the initial project uh, started. Um, up till 2002, every patch that went into Linux, and I believe you've seen Greg Crow Hartman's statistics telling you today about how many tens to were approaching hundreds of thousands of patches emerged by re uh, each release cycle. Every patch was emailed personally to Linus and personally integrated by him. This gives you an idea, given the patch volume we accept today, of why this model just wouldn't scale. And like I said, the scaling point was reached in 2002. Linus just was starting to burn out and couldn't cope. But we talked about it a lot in the term in terms of software development and open source sustainability. But one of the things I've heard from the audience is it hits them at work as a system administrator or in sales. Or Tim hit me up on Telegram and said that he's just been fighting at home, working at home, being burned out by all of the things that are at home that are not work, like the dishes or the laundry. Everything else you're behind on. Yeah, everything else. And he, he finds it distracting. Which was pretty cool because, Brent, you chimed in. You were in the conversation, and you chimed in with a couple of suggestions that you follow when you're working from home and kind of feeling that way. Support is a huge one. You know, feeling like you're connected to other people and, and sharing ideas is massive. I think you'd mentioned in there going for a walk, too. And Alex Alex suggested sometimes even just getting up and switching locations. Yeah, going for a walk changes up your ideas. Like, you've done this, Chris. Like, just go for a 10, 20-minute walk, and it's amazing how that resets your mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, and also switching locations. Like, I, I try to only do work in that specific chair in that corner of that room so that when I'm not there, I'm not thinking of work. But the opposite's also true. When I'm sitting there, all I'm doing is work. Uh, yeah. I'm trying not to do other stuff. That's interesting. Uh, Tim said that one of the things that he did was he set a little bit of time aside to just focus on cleaning his workbench first and took it away from watching YouTube time, which I thought— Oh, that's nice. Oh, we could probably all make a few cuts here or there. Or even if you just set yourself, okay, I'm going to spend X amount of time every day working on this thing that's driving me crazy. Then when you are trying to focus on your work, 
and it starts to creep into your mind, you can remind yourself, no, don't worry, you've, you've set time, you've dedicated right. time to deal with can that. can help you stay focused and gives you a little more, more energy too once you get it done. My experiment, I talked about it last week, was I launched the Chris Last Cast. And that was really interesting because it was a chance for me to try totally different equipment, totally different recording styles. And I even did one episode that I honestly was scared. Like I thought about pulling a couple of times, and wow. which I haven't pushed myself in that way in a really long time. So that felt kind of like I was um, starting, it, was, it felt new again. Like it felt really new. So that was, I feel like that, that kind of energize I got from taking a risk and then having it work out. Um, ha- I have carried that that momentum into the shows this week. Here, it, here it's been a really interesting. Even, even kind though of, it was, I mean, more work that you had to do and a, a lot of investment that, yeah. that can still end up having benefits and dividends way out of proportion. But kind of like Tim, I just watched less YouTube. <laughs> That's really what I did. Well, there you go. Um, and I, I launched a long term project called Work Life and RV at worklifeandrv.com. And I launched a blog as well that my wife and I did together, and we 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 blogged about our our solar upgrade. And we we've got pictures in there, and um, and our home our junkyard uh, home base. We did a blog. Oh, it's really that. lovely. I'm curious, what'd you use for your blog? Oh, don't worry, I'm going to do an episode okay, on it. Okay, okay, it's, it's, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely something self hosted that we're going to be talking about. Uh, which actually talked a, a little bit about some of the hosting in I think self hosted. I want to say eleven. Uh, so you can catch that. Um. I don't know, I've had a lot of fun. It was like a, I, it was a total lark. Like, I'll just try this. And it, it went really well. So I'm going to stick with some of it. Probably won't do very many Chris Last Casts. I'll probably keep it going a little bit, though. Uh, but the work life and RV thing really got a good reception. And I've got a lot to say there. And it just totally doesn't fit on the JB network. Right, a little extra space on the side so you can, you don't have to compromise on how you talk about it or cover it. You can really dive in. Yeah, and um, that's obviously something I've got a lot of experience. I've been doing it for Five years. You only talk about it all the time. Yeah, off air, it's like pretty much all I talk about. So give me, it gives me an outlet that doesn't sort of, uh, you know, wreck the on air content of JP. <laughs> if I'm being honest about it, <laughs> it was just a really, it was a really interesting experience. And I'm, it was a challenge that I put out there last week, and I'm, I'm really glad that we did it. And I got a few positive things. Um, I love, I love to hear other people's results at linuxunplugged.com slash contact. Your last episode of Chris Last Cast, the one you did it with. Jason Spizak. Uh, man, that was a good episode. <laughs> I really loved it. I ended up just sitting down and listening to it, just me and the podcast for like an hour. It was uh, it was great. So please, um, hopefully you're getting some good good feedback and, and I'd love to hear more of that. Well, thank you. That was the one that I was the most nervous about because I went out there with the title. You know, um, I also was, it gave me a chance to practice listening better and not speaking as much. And so I, for, at times, I just put my hand over my mouth so I would just listen and give give him the space to finish his thought, which is something that I don't do as often on the live shows because we are live and we are sticking to a time limit and we move on. Right, you have to manage the flow. Yeah, and so it was a chance for me to practice a skill that isn't my primary skill when I'm hosting, but one that I need to develop further. Um, and Jason's great. You know, he's got a he's got a great audio setup. He's got two different professional audio studios. He runs them all on Linux. Incredible. And the man can talk about anything. So, and he's uh, I think he's a he's a wise man too. So, thank you, Brent. I don't know if I would have done it if this burnout topic hadn't come up. But I felt like I needed to kind of get the energy level up a little bit. But I needed to do things out of the box that would scare me and challenge me a little right. bit. Get out of the get out of the grind. Feel refreshed. Yeah, and and then I is then I feel more focused than ever. It's been an interesting process. Been a good challenge. It was. I'm glad we did it. I almost want to. I almost want to keep it going, but I think now I'm just going to try to find a, a balance, which I think is what we all we all have to do. Few quick housekeeping items. I don't have a bunch in here other than to go say check out. Uh, Brunch with Brent with Peter Adams, if you haven't yet. Part 1 and 2 are both posted. He's the photographer behind the faces of open source, a great thinker himself, and that was also a great conversation. And our Telegram group. Now I think over... Is it over 1,500 now, Solid? Did we stay there? Yes, I I think We were bouncing around all weekend. Uh, No, we're at 1,499. Oh, Oh, come on. One, one away. Here's my commitment. If we can get all... If we can cross 1,500 and get all of you in one space... I will buy PBRs for everyone. <laughs> it's like fifteen hundred I mean, bucks, dude. I mean, I know, but dude, how? But come on, we're never gonna get everybody together. But I do feel like we should get like a Telegram hangout going. Absolutely. That would be that'd be yeah. really great. Like a meetup every now and then. 
something there's something there something there that we got to look into so that's at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash telegram conversation keep going after the hear show so you can go check that out and that's really i think all the housekeeping i got i think that's it wes you got anything else that Too was bad. pretty clean around right here the bell has rung yeah well that's what happens you know when we clean up after ourselves <laughs> so fosdem 2020 fosdem was started in 2000 it was a different name back then but essentially the same thing and Entrance and participation is entirely free. It's financed by sponsors who accept the non-commercial nature of the event. And there's donors amongst the visitors. You can donate, which a lot of people in our audience have. Absolutely. And do- donors receive a form and a token that gives them, like, uh, you know, an extra little note. You know, Ooh. Little, I don't know. What do you call that? Flare? Yeah, flare. And um, so it's like a four, 5,000 plus event. Carl, you were there. Yes, sir. Did you get a rough figure of the numbers? It's a little di- weird because the thing is spread across a lot of different buildings on that college campus. So every building's jam packed, but you never get a sense of all of the people all at one time. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That would be hard to measure. You're right. Carl, I'd like to get your take on Fosdem compared to events here in the States. It was definitely very different. It was the first Fosdem I'd been to. I've always heard about it. Um, the biggest thing that struck me other than the number of people there was that it's it was a lot of different projects that showed up there. I've never seen Gnome at a stateside conference, for instance. And so I ma- managed to get me a lot of Gnome stickers. Uh, I got an F-Droid sticker. I'd never seen them in a conference before. A lot of projects like that that, for whatever reason, have a lot more European contributors and they're regular they're regulars there at Fosdem, but they don't come stateside for whatever reason. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I don't make it over there very often. Indeed. Which is a real shame. So, I mean, I've always wanted to. So I'm glad you're able to make it, Carl. That's pretty great. Would you go again? Probably won't have a choice with my new job, uh, CentOS. I'm working on CentOS now for Red Hat, and so they're probably going to have me go back there again. I'd, next year, I'd like to actually make it to a few more talks. This year, I did spent most of my time at the CentOS booth and meeting a lot of my new teammates. Um, I went to a couple of talks in the distribution dev room, and what I realized was that I, I went in the morning, but once you leave, you can't really get back in because there's just a waiting, a line of people waiting to get back in. And so if you want to, if you have a distrib- uh, a dev room that you want to see the talk set for the, for the day, get there early and just camp out there the entire day. Like don't even drink water because you'll have to get up to go to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, Ace Nomad, there was a bit of a JB mini meetup at Fosdem, eh? Yeah, there is. I, I saw Byte Bitten for the first time, as well as Bitten uh, throughout the conference. And I knew there was a few other uh, JB community members there as well. I actually got to meet Carl uh, at the very, very tail end of the, uh, yeah, the super brief. last part of the day uh, for a couple minutes. So, um, yeah, it was it was great. That's neat. Fantastic. So Fosdem pumps out videos like no other conference pumps out videos. It's very impressive. It might be like 800 videos for this event and so far. And the turnaround between like when the conference happened and the videos being up. Wow. Now, we went through as many of these as we could and pulled out a few gems because there's some great stuff in there and nobody can go to everything and nobody could go through all of those clips, but we gave it a good shot. And something about me recently has really been enjoying the history aspect of Unix and Linux. And guess what? I found a talk that talks about some of the very early linkages in Unix history that were absolutely fundamental to get where we are today that we never talk about. And one of them was almost completely lost to time. And it's called the PDP-7, and it's a huge machine. But what's a PDP-7? It's a mini computer that Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, produced um, in the 60s and 70s. And it was one of a line of 18-bit computers. Now, 18-bit sounds kind of weird. We're used to 16 or 32 or 64 bits. But at the time DEC came out with this, all the mainframes were 36 bits. So 18 made sense. It was like half a mainframe or something kind of in the, in the thinking of the time. An 18-bit computer. Mini computer. And we wouldn't likely have the Berkeley BSDs if it wasn't for this rig. And it was lost to history because... Simply, records were lost, and documentation on on these um, punch cards was lost. PDP-7 Unix is largely a footnote in history. Nobody uses it today. Nobody knows about it today, except maybe, um, you know, a quick question to a trivia, or an answer to a trivia question. 
But it was very important uh, in building credibility for this group at Bell Labs. They had just had uh, spent five years with a failure in Multics, and they needed some win they could show. So they were able to use uh, the PDP-7, show it to people, show how useful it was, and were able to get the patent department to buy them a PDP-11 to port Unix to. Um, for a long time, it was believed the sources were lost to history. There's no binary artifacts from this time. Um, nothing really survived. Um, but there have been a few recent discoveries. One of them was in the home of a man named Robert Morris. It's probably a name you're not familiar with. But he invented something you likely use every single day. In 2011, uh, Robert Morris Sr. passed away. Now, he was a security researcher at Bell Labs in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And he did a lot of security things on Unix. Probably the one you're most familiar with is Etsy Password. Um, and when he passed away, he had a huge collection of papers that took a long time to go through. So his um, estate asked Doug McIlroy, who was another uh, person from Bell Labs, to go through the papers and, and, and sort out the ones of historical relevance. And in here they find old Unix manuals, maybe even what might be source code that is literally printed out. But they, they don't go much further with it until about a year later. The next year, in 2016, um, Norm Wilson um, was going through his garage and found this notebook of, of Unix source that he had copied while he worked at Bell Labs. And it turns out that it was the PDP-7 um, kernel listing and the user utilities A through F. Uh, so a group at, with the twos group um, typed this all in because you might think this would work to OCR, but when you OCR in, you get all kinds of errors and you have to recheck it anyway, so it's faster just to type it all in. So they typed it all in and created an image and enhanced SimH um, simulator to run it. And now you can run PDP-7 uh, Unix. You can run it because they typed in by hand the source code that was printed out. Glad I didn't have that job. <laughs> I know. I know. And it's, it, was, it was sort of the granddaddy to what later became the Unixes that became the BSDs, that eventually became the BSD Wars, which led to the revolution that was Linux and free software. It's, and just, it's an amazingly rich history that we're a part of. Before we go from the past, there was one bit in there, too. That oh, We'll link to the full talk, but there was one bit in there that you really got to really appreciate, and that was what a crap show early networking was. I mean, you might remember, if you, if you can recall, token ring networks and NetBuoy and IPX. There were so many different kinds of standards and ways to communicate. But more than that, there was fundamental philo philosophical differences on how the data should move around a network. Uh, networking in Unix also goes back a long ways. A lot of people say, oh, it started with Berkeley. And it turns out that there were a number of implementations before Berkeley uh, did their stack. This is, timeline-wise, 1977. Before Berkeley at AT&T, there was something called DataKit, and at Berkeley there was something called BerkNet. Uh, but BBN wrote the TCP IP stack that would actually later go into Berkeley. Um, Berkeley added a sockets API. The BBN stack had a completely different API that... Um, was more file-oriented and showed some of the limitations of the everything is a file paradigm. Isn't that fascinating? That, that, that of course, was going to be the, the Unix's first approach right. to networking. Just make it a file. Everything's a file. But the earliest ones, are, it's kind of a tie. There's something called Network Unix that the University of Illinois did in 74. And the, there's a spider cell network inside of AT&T. And I put both of these up there because it shows the split in thinking between these two groups. Everybody inside of AT&T was circuit switched. They're a phone company, they make circuit connections, so their networking was based on that. Everybody outside of AT&T was packet switched. Everything's virtual, we just send packets. And that's the school of thought that won. And that also explains why if you go back and look at these early Unixes, um, a lot of the ones from Bell Labs don't have any TCP IP stack. Um, because they had this giant blind spot. They thought everything was going to be um, circuit switched. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. I mean, it makes perfect sense, mm -hmm. but wow. I know. It could have gone a different way. 
Now, to show you sort of an opposite side of Fosdem, there's also a much more modern side. Ironically, right now while we stream, there's a conversation in the chat room about confusion around IRC. And this was one of the points that Matthew, I think it's Broberg? Yeah, that's a great name, <laughs> Broberg. I love that. Absolutely. Matthew is making the point that none of you that are longtime Linux users are going to want to hear, and that is the next generation of contributors does not want to get on IRC. Uh, but my pathway is not the same as I know many others have gone through. Uh, that started with IRC just being a logical, simple thing. Um, but for me, it's still, it's still this. Even though I understand where it comes from and I understand it had its, its place in time, I feel as if it's not as in inviting as that incredible GitHub issue that didn't shame me or make me feel stupid. He's making the case that people who get into open source development sort of through the GitHub channels hmm. and Slack and all these other, Riot Chat, all these other platforms, they look at IRC as if it's something of the Stone Age. And he has numbers to back it up. To put it in some context, I understand when IRC uh, came out and became the de facto standard, it's because there's a lot of empty space around. It was IRC or nothing to communicate. Um, I guess telnetting and reading each other's things is something that I've read about as well, but I'll just put that aside. I don't know it very well. Uh, but if we fast forward to today, the, the stats I've been able to find is that IRC is hovering around 400,000 active users in the last year or so. Um, and we look at some of the other synchronous communication channels that people are talking about. We've got Microsoft Teams. Okay, so 400,000 for IRC. This is the network effect. you have any guesses for Teams? Which you know is going to be smaller than Slack. Yeah, it's going to be smaller than Slack. Um, let's, go with, uh, let's go with a million. Just people have to use that for work and don't necessarily love it. Uh, there's 13 million people on that. Slack, people love it. O open source communities hate it. 12 million users. Um, Riot, that I am very impressive that they've grown to well over 11 million users. These numbers are odd because uh, wow. Teams, he says, is bigger, which I guess maybe it's possible. Microsoft has quite a has a reach, um, and you know Slack doesn't have the built-in uh, right, market so just with your subscription. I can see it. Uh, but the the really surprising one there was uh, Riot. Chat. That's great news. Yeah, it is. Google Chat, it's like slowly waning in the background, but uh, at four million. Uh, and that's just synchronous communication channels, and that's just recently. If we zoom out even further and think about like the ways in which we interact with communities in the technology space, you've got Twitter, which is my default place to co uh, conversate with community members at 126 million users. Telegram is way more massive than I ever realized at 200 million, and a lot more open source communities are talking there. Discord is humongous. Reddit is a complete beast when we think about it. <laughs> yeah, when you when you consider some of the online communities, it's Absolutely. even more. So right now we have two hundred and seventy one people in our IRC room, and we have we've now crossed the fifteen hundred line uh, at the uh, Telegram group. I I really feel like the the end is nigh for IRC as a primary community communications tool. Yeah, I mean, is this the does this mean IRC should just dwindle away and we and we move on? No, I, I think it doesn't. Technology doesn't work like that. Yeah, you know, even Betamax is actually still around. Not very much anymore, but uh, for many years after the "quote unquote" Betamax VHS wars, production shops still used Betamax. Just like, um, just because Sirius XM launches doesn't mean there's not FM radio still. It'll always be around. But I think when you're trying to draw in as many contributors as possible and bring in fresh contributors, I think it's something you got to at least consider and think about. Yeah, it's just not it's not easy to get started with and unless you really start learning it well, it doesn't have the features that people are used to or expecting, especially if you want, you know, contributors who are a little less de dedicated may just be doing this a, a couple weekends a month. Sure. And they want low barrier of entry. Mm -hmm. Uh in his talk he talks about how the whole uh, Nick serve stuff where it gets you to authenticate is it's like just too much. Like, just like it was way too much. I felt like I was fighting the computer immediately as soon as I logged on. Cassidy, it sounds like you guys have some experience with this. Yeah, we uh, we used to do all of our development over on IRC for elementary. And honestly, one of the best decisions we've made as a project was moving away from IRC to um, kind of two other mentalities. One is uh, using non-real-time platforms better, like GitHub issue tracking. And then other chat apps are just a way better experience for people than IRC. And it's way easier. It, it lowers the barrier of entry to, to new contributors. The integration thing can kind of be nice. And a lot of different platforms offer this where 
You can tie it in with existing workflows so there's automatic notifications when somebody commits something and you can have a conversation based around an issue right there in your main chat program. Yeah, exactly. Like we call our, uh, we have a private Slack for contributors and we call it our virtual private office because it's like when you're working, you're in the office, you're in Slack. When you're not working, you close it and uh, you do all your communication right there and it's great. Yeah. And it has a lot more support for I'm available. I'm in a meeting. I, I, are you sure you want to disturb this person because they're in a different time zone and you're going <laughs> to, yeah. like these things matter when you're working in an international team. I, but I don't think it's gone. I mean, I'm not going to stop using IRC, but um, I think it will be relegated to probably the existing communities. I mean, those numbers are devastating. 400,000. I mean, who knows if they're accurate, but they're probably in the ballpark. I mean, we just saw some news, what, that IBM was going with Slack and has 350,000 employees. So that, <laughs> that's kind of the scale. Ooh, yeah, really, no kidding. All right, well, you found a talk that seemed to grab your attention called The Selfish Contributor. I'm going to take you on a journey through the deep, dark, motivational secrets, the seamy underbelly of open source, how people can actually get engineers to contribute efficiently to the open source project. Um, I'm James Bottomley. I work for IBM, as you can see from my email address. Um, I'm actually a very old school open source person, so my open source experience actually goes back to 1982 with uh, looking at the source code of what was then BSD. Um, so that means I've spent almost 40 years in open source. Yeah, James is also the SCSI maintainer and he really has a long history in working with open source and in particular has seen how, well, we like to talk about some of the altruistic motives involved in open source, right? You're helping the community, you're adding to the, the betterment of, of everyone, really a lot of things open source is, is a shared good, but we have to acknowledge that a lot of people's actions are primarily self-interested, right? I mean, you're you're scratching your own itch and he, he kind of acknowledges that and you need to think about that if you want to make these projects work as well as they can. So the trap is that once you run into the scaling problem, the temptation is to flow control. I mean, you're all engineers. Everybody knows that if you've got a congestion problem, you flow control it. So the, flow, the natural flow control you would think of is you know, tap the source, push back on the contributors, try and slow down the contributions, make the pipeline flow much more evenly. And effectively, the temptation, therefore, is to try and push the problem onto the contributors, to raise barriers to contribution. Right, and that's sometimes what you see with things like IRC. Or in the kernel's case, you know, we, we talked about that scaling problem with Linus, and they solved it at that level, at the maintainer level, with tooling in particular, inventing Git and, and having a system with, with maintainers where you could have multiple trees managed and then merged together into one. And, and that's all kind of all about respecting your users and contributors. But conditioning contributions on mandatory unrelated actions, the quid pro quo, makes contributors feel used. You know, it, it feels like the project is stealing your free time. You're not giving it voluntarily because you want to get this patch upstream. Perhaps your employer has charged you to get this patch upstream. So you have to satisfy this quid pro quo to get this to happen. And it makes you feel very used and unhappy. Scaling problems must be solved in the acceptance layer. They must be solved by tooling. They must be solved by the maintainers. If you push the scaling problem down onto the contributors, you're setting your project up for failure eventually. I mean, it will chunter on for a long time. Perhaps it will be a popular project for a long time. But the moment your popularity starts to wane, as it did in the kernel a long time ago, is the moment that your contributors will start to remember all of the wrongs you've done to them and start to move off onto the trendier projects. If you want to keep a committed contributor base, you need to treat them well. Wow, this feels like we've just come full circle on a month-long conversation we've been having at the meta level on this show. That's really great. And there's so many more things. I really liked um, everything I grabbed. Uh, this with the server was really feeling the load <laughs> this last weekend, and it probably will be because they're still adding more videos, so people are still coming and checking, and not everything's actually yeah, up it's, yet. Yeah, it's a tall order to get through them all. We'll have some of our favorites linked in the show notes, and they're definitely worth checking out, especially a couple. There's been a lot of discussion lately around, you know, do Linux distros still matter in the age of containers and Kubernetes? Yeah, there's some good answers to that. Hmm. Uh, Minimac has a follow-up to the IRC topic. Go ahead. Um, I think IRC will stay forever. It's like ham radio. It will never die. And someday we will be happy to have it. I could see that. It's, it's, it's very low bandwidth, number one. And the text-based nature of it means that it's always going to be advantageous for some reason. And like the conversation was continuing in the chat room, there's tools on top of IRC now that give it some of that additional image previewing or integration or those kinds of things. Your thoughts, Byte? 
Well, you at least need IRC for all those botnets. <laughs> I do. I would hate to say goodbye to JBot if nothing else. You know, now if, oh yeah, JBot's like uh, <clears throat> like been. It's like the old the old uh, bot that's been around for so it's long the now. Cute that, little broken robot that still kind of works. Yeah, it's over there running in the wall right now, but it's still grabbing title suggestions, which we are not getting enough of. Chat room. I will shut that IRC down. For shame. <laughs> well, uh, Carl, any other kind of closing uh, notes or anything else you want to touch on about Fosdom? This is your moment to be our uh, reporter on the scene. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that you felt like maybe we're missing in our chat here. Uh, did you see the picture that I posted about uh, kind of the summary of Fosdom? I don't know if I did. If you go to Fosdom's Wikipedia page, the, uh, the the main picture on there besides the logo is just one of the rooms with oh, a full yes. sign on it. They are very strict about fire code and things like that there. And so that's it's off-putting to a lot of people. Um, this was my first one. and But after going, I heard a lot of people complaining about how they couldn't get into any of the talks they wanted to. Uh, I mentioned like the dev rooms where you just kind of had to camp out all day long and you wouldn't get your seat back if you even went to the bathroom. Um, it can be a little off putting, but I don't really, I don't know how they would solve that. When you have that many people interested in going, you don't want to just tell them not to come. Um, one of their big appeals is that they don't require any registration. It's also free as in money. Like it doesn't cost anything and they just have so much attendance that they have a lot of logistical problems around it. Yeah. That is a tricky balance. I have tried to get into a talk and been told, nope, room's full. And they're like kind of, they've had to say it a hundred times, so they're kind of not very rough with it. Maybe. Yeah, that's the way to put it. Not patient. Yeah. It, it definitely is part of what makes it great, but also part of what makes it not so great. Um, you know, maybe they could think about how to scale that a little better. I'm not sure. Yeah, the um, Texas Cyber Summit that we went to, I think, was doing live streams at the event over like a Wi-Fi network or something. Do you recall that? They had a way to tune into rooms that you weren't in for oh, a lot Oh, yeah, of that them. was pretty convenient. And uh, I don't know how much of that made it public, but it, they, they had a resource for um, goers that uh, wanted to tune into it. But it's not you don't go and travel all that way to get an audio feed with bad mic audio. Because, I mean, this mic audio is, you know, that's even after we've cleaned it up. <laughs> We're cleaning it up and fixing their audio, and it still doesn't it's, sound It's great. never quite like being in the room. <laughs> it's really, yeah, it really is what it's about. Lots of people there at Fosdem, they just completely ignore the sessions, just focus on the hallway track and face-to-face -face time with people because Fosdem's so good about their video recording. Well, that's what it is, man. That's it. Really is. After all, I I used people used to say, oh, it's all about the hallway track, and I thought that's a waste of money. You are irresponsible. You should be taking advantage of that time and learning. And not that that isn't part of going, but now here I am, like ten years into that plus, and it's like, oh yeah, you know what? Really is the best part is seeing people catching up, talking about what they're doing, problems they're solving. It's really way more valuable than you realize. I mean, that's that's the community right there. I really like having a mix. Like the hallway track's great and getting to talk to people, but I also there are some talks that I hey, I want to see that live like right now and ask questions. And, you know, it's just off putting not being able to get into a room. Yeah. I yeah. still think we're gonna have to find our way over there sooner rather than later. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, although I kinda like um, like Linux Fest Northwest is about as big as I like. Scale is a little too much for me. Mm. And Texas Linux Fest is the perfect size for me, but I think it could also grow a bit. But there's a different, there's um, there's like a, a, a sort of a diminishing return on results when it starts getting too big. Right, and you become, it becomes a little more chaotic and a little less sort of community feel. Could you imagine like another couple thousand at Linux Fest Northwest? Oof, that'd be tight. It'd be a lot. It'd be a lot. It's a nice campus, but it'd be a lot. Okay, well, do check out the resources for Fosdem. There's a lot to dig into, and it's still pretty neat to see a community-funded event like this going strong now for 20 years. And uh, you're right, Wes. We do need to make it over there. All right, some picks? Of course. All right, before we exit this week, I want to follow up on something we just sort of tossed out recently. We said there's that, there's that really cool... Um, thing you can run on the terminal that makes it look like you're doing a bunch of really cool hacker work. And uh, yeah, we figured it out. It's called Hollywood. And it's available as a snap. Created a by uh, Dustin Kirkland. Yeah. Yeah, and he's also published it as a Docker container. <laughs> oh, he can just go get it off of GitHub. It, uh, it's the uh, perfect thing to put up in a terminal window and put on a virtual uh, desktop. And then anytime you need to look like you're working on something that's unbelievable that only Linux could do, you flip over to that. He calls it Hollywood because it is quintessential 
kind of Hollywood crazy stuff going on your screen that looks like hacker type activities. And um, I love it. I love it a lot. And he was uh, tweeting Elon Musk last week. This is how I came across it again. He was tweeting Elon Musk, encouraging him to uh, integrate it into the Tesla screens. Wouldn't that be amazing? (laughs) And I'm like, yes. And it's running Linux, right? Isn't that thing running Linux? Of course. So uh, I think you should get in on that. It really is impressive, too. I mean, like, they they put in some some time into work to get, like, a diverse array of different technical information with all the, you know, fancy Unicode you could want. It's so great. And it pulls in a few bits, like your username and stuff, so you can see, like, a few things in there that look kind of legitimate going by. Uh, And then this one has been on our Get To list for a long time. In fact, so long that I haven't tried it recently. Is that a word, Wes? No. Have you? No, it's recently. Oh, dang it. You're close, though. So close, Wes. It's called SharePoint Sync, and it's an AirPlay audio receiver. So if you got it's yourself— a receiver. Mm-hmm. I was confused by that at first. What's, what's, going on? Oh, what's, I, what's, what's, what's the problem? You, go on, you explain it. Here, well, here's, here's your use case scenario, but there's lots. I mean, you could toss this thing on an old Pisces, hook it up to a speaker, and then you just got yourself a $50 HomePod. Ah, you know what I'm saying? There we go. But uh, here's the more practical use case. Say you got yourself one of those iOS devices, which I know you don't, but let's just say you did. Sure, sure. There's a scenario that those of us who are listening to a podcast on the road run into when we get to work and we want to continue listening on our desktop speakers where we got nicer speakers. You you want to, like, keep listening. So what you can do now is you get out of the car, you walk into the old office, you sit down at the old desk, you got this running on your machine, you hit this button, your Linux box starts receiving the audio from your phone and starts playing it over your desktop speakers. You finish off the podcast. Now that is neat. That's why I wanted it. <laughs> That's why I got it. I kind of like it. You're like capturing from that, that they're proprietary worlds and, yeah. and playing with it right I there know. in Linux. And once you get it in Linux, you think about it, you could probably capture the audio pretty easily. Like you could do anything with it. So it's called SharePoint Sync. I don't know why they call it Microsoft's <laughs> internet name thing. Oh, it's SharePort. Oh, thanks. God, what is the matter with me? It's like once it's in, once it's in the old noggin, once my peepers read it one way and put store it in the old noggin, that's just how it comes out. SharePoint wouldn't make any sense. That's the Microsoft thing. That would be a dumb name for a product like this. Although I'll be honest with you, SharePoint, not much better. But uh, you get the idea. Looks like a great project. Yeah. And it's supposedly, suppose, supposedly, suppose, to synchronize with the AirPlay video tracking. So if you're watching a video on your internet phone, it'll be in sync with the, with the audio coming out of the speakers. That is impressive. Yeah. And uh, he has gone to uh, extra care, as he puts it, to work well with Pulse Audio uh, on desktop Linuxes. That's neat, too, just like having your, your iOS device show up right in Pulse. Yeah. Awesome. Cody does it, too. Cody, it works in Cody. Cody, you can go into Cody and turn this on. They're doing their own thing to make this possible. So you can also do it to, a, to like, a TV hooked up to, like, you know, some nice speakers with the old Cody. That'll work as well. Turns out a lot of uh, Linux users also have iPhones. Well, maybe. Maybe, or maybe it's just me. But now I'm just open about it. You know, I used to be ashamed, but, uh, yeah. Ain't think, nothing wrong with that. Uh, I think they're both great, honestly. I mean, I, the truth of the matter is I have a Pixel as well. And a Pine phone now. Yeah, and a Pine phone. <laughs> God, what is the matter with me? This is ridiculous. We got we to gotta get out of here. I need to go do some reflecting on all this. Maybe stop by the pawn shop. <laughs> you get some more SIM cards. <laughs> Actually, I did get a SIM card in. Got a Ting SIM card. Ting. Tell us a little more about Ting. You know, if you go to last.ting.com. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's still there. I don't know. But you get $25. And listen, most Ting bills are around $23 or $24 a month there, cheese. So <laughs> you pay for your first month. All right. Well, listen, um, we're getting out of here. Be sure to tune in live. It's a lot of fun. It's a huge mumble room. You can get information if you just Google search for Jupiter Colony Mumble. The show is live on Tuesdays, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar for in your local time zone. And we'll see you back here next Tuesday. JBTitles.com. Everybody go vote. 
We got to get our titles in. JB Titles, jbtitles.com. Everyone go. We, we literally can't do it without go you. Go boat. Um, and also, I just want to take a second again and say, Dusty, I've been wanting you to join us forever. So I'm really glad that Carl twisted your arm and uh, got you to do it. Uh, you work with CoreOS, right? Yep, that's right. What do you do with CoreOS? Uh, it hasn't changed a whole lot since the last time I interviewed with you, but mostly helping do the engineering side of things with Fedora CoreOS and also uh, a little bit of community stewardship there. So, okay. All right. So help me understand. So when you say this, uh, really, you're it's Fedora CoreOS you work on now, not CoreOS anymore. So that's where my confusion. So you're not actually maintaining, or are you maintaining both of them? Like, what is this? Are you doing that until September? Like, what is the situation there? Yeah. So we, within... Uh, our teams, we try to separate out the terminology a little bit. So, for example, if you talk about uh, the old offering from CoreOS Inc., um, we call that Container Linux because okay. they had they renamed it, you know, I guess a, a while back before you know any Red Hat acquisition or anything like that. Um, so it's called Container Linux. Uh, and then if you're talking about, um, you know, some of the new offerings, we either call it Fedora CoreOS or uh, there's the the enterprise offering that OpenShift runs on top of uh, that's called uh, RHEL CoreOS or some people call it, you know, Red Hat CoreOS. And so if somebody says CoreOS, they're referring to RHEL CoreOS, which works with OpenShift? When somebody says CoreOS, we have to ask them what they really mean. That's what I was trying to get to by you. <laughs> He's not going to give you a clear answer on purpose. <laughs> yeah, so I primarily work um, on Fedora CoreOS. That feeds into the Red Hat CoreOS um, piece that OpenShift runs on top of. So I do uh, work there as well anytime bugs need to be fixed or whatnot, I participate in those um, duties. Um, but as far as container Linux goes, I don't personally touch that as much um, just because, you know, the team of people who were doing that, um, you know, already had a lot of the knowledge. We did some cross-pollination there. Uh, we have had some of our new team members run some of those processes to do releases and stuff, uh, but we don't touch them as much as um, the people who were responsible for them before the acquisition. Mm. So um, you were on in 2018 around what June. So how much is that? How, how much has your role shifted since? I mean, that's quite a while ago now, a year and a half. How long? How much? How much have things shifted for you for your day to day roles? It's a, <laughs> mostly the same. Um, you know, we've had a lot of work that we've done in the community, uh, just taking the two projects, the Atomic Host project and the uh, Container Linux projects, and putting them together um, has been quite a lot of work, uh, just mainly because Container Linux, the model there with the streams um, is pretty different than what Fedora is um, typically built on today. So with Fedora, we have Rawhide, we have updates testing, we have updates, um, and that that model is a little bit different than what Container Linux have with the um, alpha beta stable. And so what we've tried to do is mold the Fedora model a little bit to get an, a, a stable and testing uh, stream as well as something that we're calling next, which is not quite what alpha was for Container Linux, but we'll more closely follow, um, you know, what Rawhide is or what the branch next release is for Fedora Core OS. Um, so we've kind of gone through a lot of like, oh, evaluate what Container Linux was, their release processes, their guarantees to the community, um, you know, the technology underneath, evaluate what Atomic Host was, its relationship to Fedora, um, you know, what kind of community we had, what are the things we wanted to, to support, what are the things we didn't want to support. Um, and it's just been a very large effort to resolve all of those things and then put it all together and start to build Steam, start to do releases every two weeks uh, and start to exercise those release processes that we've uh, recently defined. Wow, no kidding. Um, do you have a, a rough sense of the size of the container Linux user base? Is it hundreds of thousands? I mean, do you have a rough ballpark number? Because I was look, I was looking at the transition plan, and it looks like it's it's there's flat car for them if they want something that's a direct 
migration, but it looks like there's not a perfect solution for all particular use cases. Um, and I wonder if uh, <clears throat> if this is a, like, are we talking like, is this a ginormous market disruption or is this going to impact a few thousand people? Like what's the ballpark figure there? Yeah. So I, I don't know exact numbers there. Um, you know, I, it's, it's, <laughs> it's definitely not less than 10,000 and it's not, um, you Hundreds. Know, it's not a million either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. but uh, you know, they, they had some, I guess, data on how many users were checking in on a daily basis. And then they also got data from, uh, different cloud providers, letting them know, all right, here's how many, um, instances were spun up, you know, in a given month or whatnot. And, um, you know, I'm not sure how reliable, uh, you know, the numbers that I mm -hmm. know about are, but it's, it's, it's not a small market and it's not a huge market either. It's somewhere in between. Um, but what we've tried to do is communicate from the beginning about differences that are, are going to happen with, you know, the migration from what Container Linux was um, and give people enough information from the beginning to be able to, you know, make decisions for, for what they need to do in the future. Fedora Core OS uh, has had a preview that came out in July of last year. Um, so we've been taking feedback from community members, you know, ever since that came out and really trying to, you know, not just drop anybody right on their face. Um, but luckily, flat card does exist as well. So we had a guy come in earlier today and was like, hey, can I migrate from Container Linux? And unfortunately, the answer is no, because it's a completely different model, right? We, we, our updates aren't based on a block device. It's based on a file system, right? So the answer is no. He can't directly upgrade his existing Container Linux node to Fedora Core OS. You could probably move the container workloads, though, if you set up a new host. Exactly. Yeah, part of the idea behind Container Linux itself was that you essentially define uh, how that node is going to be started and provisioned using Ignition from the beginning, right? And so if you define everything about that node in this one, uh, you know, Ignition config, which is JSON, then you should be able to take that Ignition config to any number of nodes and just spawn them off, you know, just start them up, right? Um, so the idea there is that you encode everything that's needed for this node to know what it needs to do in life um, in that config, and then it's really easy to start new nodes, right? So the idea there is, uh, you know, migration, as long as they have a, a configuration file that defines what that node's life is or view of the world is, uh, is not that big of a deal because, honestly, um, you know, spawning new instances should be kind of normal day-to-day -day stuff in, in our, um, you know, more cloud native world, right? There's existing bare metal instances that kind of don't live by that model, but we're trying to get people more to that model. Um, and so unfortunately for this guy, his case was that he was in a different state than where his server was. And he also didn't have any sort of lights out management for that server. So fortunately for people like that, um, there is flat car, right? So, you know, we're actually appreciative of that project existing for people to have somewhere to go if they really can't migrate to Fedora Core OS. But, um, you know, that's just an example of a community spawning up where a need exists, right? I love that. Um, well, I'm glad you're able to stop by and uh, update us. I encourage you to join us anytime you have the time, and I'll leave you uh, with a bit of advice. If Carl ever tells you something's good eats, you trust that man at his word. He knows good food. Oh, yeah. <laughs>